This video is about a region and a road. The gorno badakhshan region of Tajikistan, otherwise known as the Pamir Mountains, and the Pamir Highway. The Badakhshan Autonomous Area is more than 40% of Tajikistan's territory, but with a population just a touch over 200,000, it's only about 3% of the population. It is probably the poorest part of the poorest country in the former Soviet Union. It's one of the world's highest inhabited mountain areas, with people living as high as 4,200 meters, which is the upper limit of any permanent human settlement on Earth. Over the course of the journey, if you start in Dushanbe, the capital of Tajikistan, you climb from about 800 meters to a height of 4,655 meters. This video is about the people and the places along that highway. I was traveling with two friends, and our journey started as we left Dushanbe, the capital of Tajikistan. First we stopped to admire the Nurek Dam on the way, and I tried some stew of indeterminate animal parts. The quality of the roads varies wildly. Most of the new ones are courtesy of China, a product of the regional competition and diplomacy that is quietly being fought in the region. We reached the border with Afghanistan, which we would be following for days. Across the river in Afghanistan, some boys were going down to the water to swim. Kum, where we stayed, we walked into town. We had heard there was a band visiting from Dushanbe. They were playing at the theme park. First, it was the turn of the children to dance. <laughs> This video was filmed in July 2021, before the Americans had withdrawn from Afghanistan, but the Taliban had won control of much of the country. It was a surreal thought that across the river, which at that point was already Taliban territory, almost all of what we saw that night, the music, the dancing, men and women socializing together, was forbidden. We hitched a ride back to the hotel in a cop car organized for us by the chief of police. That night, from across the river, we could hear the sound of gunfire and artillery, which continued into the morning. The first stop the next day was to visit some ruins up on this ridge. From time to time we could still hear the sounds of fighting over the river ringing out through the valley. So below the bridge? That's, that's Taliban, yeah. where the car is approaching. A little further on, we passed a Taliban outpost. It was very strange that the only thing separating us was this water, but that, in effect, 
It separated us totally. of vehicles being driven down the highway delivered from China. More about that later in the video. morning to a brilliant day and white mulberries drying in the sunshine. We got back on the highway for a short distance before turning up the Bartang Valley. We were hiking to Jizu, a small village up in the hills. entirely self-sufficient. For lunch we ate homemade yogurt with homemade jam on bread baked right there in the village. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the people of the region. In Gorno Badakhshan the two big groups are the Kyrgyz and the Pamiris, but by far the majority are the Pamiris. The Pamiris are an Eastern Iranian ethnic group and there are Pamiris in Afghanistan as well as Xinjiang in China across the border. But by far the biggest number are here in Gorno Badakhshan in Tajikistan. There is some uh, debate about whether Pamiris should be considered Tajiks or not. Speakers of Pamiri languages can't necessarily understand Tajik speakers and vice versa. Most Pamiris are Nazari Ismailis, a branch of Shia Islam, and even though religion was suppressed during the Soviet period, it was still practiced. There are also Sunni Pamiris, but only a few thousand. The Kyrgyz, who are a majority in some areas of the Pamirs, are also Sunni, as are almost all Tajiks in other parts of the country. The Ismailis follow the Aga Khan, who traces his descent from the Prophet Muhammad 1400 years ago. Since 1957, the holder of the title is the 49th Imam. The Prince Shah Karim al Husseini, who is the fourth Aga Khan. He is a Swiss born British citizen who mainly lives in France and he skied for Iran in the 1964 Winter Olympics while he was Aga Khan. In general, from the people that I've spoken to, the Pamiri identity is very different, very specific, and people are really, really worried about the disappearance of things like Pamiri languages, simply because there aren't strong incentives for young people to learn those languages. People have moved to Dushanbe, there aren't many residents of the Pamir region. The number of speakers of these languages is going down drastically. All that adds up to a situation, from what I understand from talking to people, in which this region might look very, very different in 30 or 40 years with a lot of lost languages as well as traditions. There's kind of the string of villages up along this river. And as you've seen, it is absolutely stunning. But economically, there's not really much here. Whoa, there's a snake. There's pretty much, as far as I can tell, just uh, cattle herding and I think they probably sell a few crops. But apart from that, there's not really much. It's just tourism and of course, these last two years, there haven't been any tourists because of coronavirus and it has been devastating up here. It's really interesting, you've got the main river down there, but then you've also got this network, multiple 
of these really cool irrigation streams that are they wind around trees like this and you can see the kind of a lot of work must go into like keeping them maintained it's really interesting and they follow the paths or probably the paths follow them from lake to lake down here so that they can grow their crops and, and stuff it's a it works the thing that's going to be lost if these communities disappear is not just the beauty of it the people that are here and the tragedy of them losing losing their livelihoods it's all of these traditions and skills that they have built up from living up here for so long self-sustainably making jam making bread these infinite little skills that they would have learned how to do lost my foot though. Yogurt with blackberry jam is the best thing ever. The night before, word had reached the village that one of the men's cows was found dead. At first they thought it had been attacked by a snow leopard, which is a common occurrence, but it turned out it was a rockfall. Wolf attacks are known to happen as well, and people have been killed in the past. The man walked three or four hours up into the mountains, slept there by the dead animal, cut it up and then carried it back down. The only electricity in the village is for their solar powered lights, so they don't have any refrigeration. They weighed the meat before taking it down the hill to sell it to a restaurant on the main road. Life is very difficult in the village. Many of them want to live somewhere with more opportunities or want their children to. Just about the only cash income is from tourists like us. So if you are doing the Pamir Highway yourself, I would absolutely recommend staying in Jizu village or finding a homestay like it. It genuinely really does help and the money goes straight to the people who most need it. For us, however, it was time to get back to the highway. We were going to Korog, the capital of the Pamirs. The next morning we admired the view of Korog and visited the bazaar. You can tell this man is Kyrgyz because of his cool hat. We visited some hot springs where I had the pleasure of sitting naked with some dudes I didn't know. As we got closer to Ishkashim, we began to see more of a military presence. That morning in Korog, we had woken to the news that the night before over 1,000 Afghan troops had been forced across this bridge at Ishkashim into Tajikistan and were being held at the military base. There were snipers watching the bridge. And the crisis in Afghanistan has put its neighbors on high alert. Tajikistan is bolstering its border with Afghanistan as the situation in the country deteriorates. More than 20,000 troops have been sent to the Afghanistan border. This after over 1,000 Afghan troops fled to the country after Taliban attacked the Badakhshan province. Day six was another day of driving, our last before the real climb in altitude started. 
There were fewer trees and wider landscapes. We broke up the drive with a visit to Yamchun Fortress. It dates from about 1700 years ago, built by the Kushan Empire to protect their trade routes, long before the Muslim conquests. Day seven, we were looking for some petroglyphs or ancient drawings on rocks. Now, these mountains you can see behind me are an interesting piece of political geography. This narrow strip of land is the Wakan Corridor and is the product of a very strange moment in history. At the end of the 19th century, following decades of competition in Central Asia between Britain and Russia, the two powers realized that there was this patch of earth that nobody had claimed, or rather, it was a tiny principality ruled by an emir, but in geopolitical terms at that time, that was as good as belonging to no one because it wasn't claimed by a big recognized country. Russia had by that point annexed the rest of Central Asia, which was called Russian Turkestan. They didn't want to directly border British forces, and Britain didn't want Russia on the doorstep of British India. So they decided to keep themselves apart and carve out this wafer-thin buffer that would run all the way to China and would be given to neutral Afghanistan. Only around 12,000 people live in the whole strip of land, mostly Pamiris with a few Kyrgyz, which is only 13 kilometers wide at its narrowest point. There's another strange story about the Wakhan Corridor as well. In 1916, a whole bunch of Kyrgyz shepherds fled conscription in Russia and resettled in Afghanistan in the Wakhan Corridor. Then, when the Afghan wars started in the 1970s, a bunch of them moved to Pakistan, where they were put into refugee camps. A few hundred of them died. From these refugee camps, wanting to continue their ancient way of life, they applied to be able to resettle in Alaska in the US, which would be pretty yak friendly. They say that they were rejected. So, a little more than a thousand were eventually resettled in Turkey. They were sent to a part where they were surrounded by Kurds. In fact, the Turkish government actually resettled them on the site of a massacre of Kurds in the 1930s, which the Kyrgyz, who had been moved, only found out about later. Meanwhile, the population of these Kyrgyz in Turkey has increased to around 5,000, and their relationship with the Kurds has gotten quite tense. With few job opportunities, many of these Kyrgyz found work with a Turkish militia, which was mobilized against the Kurdish group, the PKK. In fact, in 1993, there was even a rocket attack on the Kyrgyz town. So they left one inter-ethnic conflict in Afghanistan just to be inserted into another in Turkey. With our touristing for the morning completed, the climb began. This little stream marks the final part of the border with Afghanistan. It's fast, but shallow, so if you're brave, you could conceivably and illegally walk across. stopped for lunch at the Hotel Golden Fish. This is Kyrgyz? This is Kyrgyz, yes. Interesting. This is yak milk. Excuse me. It wasn't much further to Murgab, where we would be spending the night. We passed Suslik, a ground squirrel that lives on the high alpine pastures, and huge flocks of sheep that scattered as we passed. a giant statue of a snow leopard. As we got close to Murgab, there were more checkpoints and some sort of outdoor holding pen of cheap mountain animal statues. Murgab 
is the highest town in all of Tajikistan at 3,650 meters above sea level and the only real population center in all of the High Pamiras. It has about 4,000 people. Both the town and the district of Murgab are actually majority Kyrgyz, not Pamiri. The Kyrgyz language is Turkic, just like the Turks of Turkey, or like the Uzbeks and the Kazakhs. The Pamiri languages are Iranian, and so are part of the same family as the rest of the Tajiks of Tajikistan, even if they aren't mutually intelligible with Tajik itself. here you can always find pictures of Tajikistan's dear president, Emomili Rahman. He's the one at the back. Like everywhere in the region, the highway is the dominant feature. People don't grow crops up here because the growing season is too short. They keep animals and bring the vegetables up from below. <laughs> And the dogs are big. They have to be, to keep away the wolves. So, it is an absolutely stunning morning here in Murgab. It's really noticeable, the altitude here. I can, I'm breathing much more heavily than I would normally be. I think, and I think it's a good time to talk a little bit more about the context of the region. So before the Russians arrived at the end of the 19th century, the area which is now Gorno Badakhshan was just really a collection of self-governing little statelets. Many people here actually have family on the Chinese side of the border, and in fact Kashgar in Xinjiang used to be the closest trading hub until the establishment of the Soviet Union. So in the first few years after the Russian Revolution, being part of the Soviet Union out here on the periphery wasn't really a reality until the 1930s when the Pamir Highway was built. And the Pamir Highway is now and has been since then the defining feature of the human geography of the region. According to what I've read, it is this road, the Pamir Highway, which is the dividing line between the old world and the modern one. Instead of just being nominally a part of it, it meant real integration into the giant multi-ethnic entity which was the Soviet Union. For one thing, since the building of the highway, the closest trading hub has been Osh in Kyrgyzstan because of course the highway was built to connect the Soviet Union. It has never in the history of the Pamir region been Dushanbe which is the capital of Tajikistan, simply because it is ages away from here. By the end of the 1930s, the border had properly been established and militarized, and the curtain came down, breaking any remaining cross-border ties. In fact, though, it wasn't until the 1960s that equipment like snow plows and bulldozers both existed and were provided to keep the Pamir Highway open all year round. Wow. You really notice even a pretty easy walk at this altitude. However, the story of Gorno Barakshan as simply an isolated periphery is more complicated. One of the Soviet Union's perpetual priorities was securing its borders. And of course, this is an extremely sensitive area, being between China and Afghanistan. So as well as keeping this area controlled and surveilled, it also wanted to keep the population here somewhat satisfied and, of course, loyal. The stores were kept stocked and there were educational as well as employment opportunities, in addition to higher salaries and other privileges. This period, which dates roughly from the 1960s onwards, is still fondly remembered as Moscow provisioning. It's because of this, what one anthropologist calls being a center in the periphery, that many people in the region consider themselves better educated and more modern than other Central Asians, especially the Tajiks of the flatlands. Historically, they've spoken better Russian and been more connected 
to what was happening in other parts of the Soviet Union. With the end of the Soviet Union came the end of Moscow provisioning. It meant fewer resources, and the influence of drug trafficking grew. In fact, opium is moved from Afghanistan on this very highway. So the Pamiris of Gorno Badakhshan are on the margins geographically, in the sense that they are very, very far from their capital, as well as linguistically and religiously. But they don't necessarily see themselves as being marginalized, partly because they think of themselves as being more modern due to their historic engagement with the Soviet state, as well as, perhaps, because of their religion, being Shia Ismaili compared to the Sunni majority in the rest of the country. From the point of view of Khorog, which is the capital of all of gorno Badakhshan, Murgab is an isolated, unhealthy place, and many, many people from Khorog haven't even been out here. While in Khorog, most people follow Dushanbe time, a lot of people here follow Murgabi time, unofficially, which is actually an hour in front, which is the same as Kyrgyzstan. After all, Dushanbe is a thousand kilometers away by road. That can actually cause a lot of friction between locals following Murgabi time and local officials who follow Dushanbe time. Though they live side by side and have for a long time, there is very little mixing between the Kyrgyz and the Pamiris. Along the Pamir Highway, and I find this very difficult to believe, but I read it in a legitimate source, there are only 12 recorded inter-ethnic marriages. All of those date from the Soviet time when inter-ethnic harmony was actively encouraged. The Kyrgyz are Sunni and historically nomadic. The Pamiris are Shia and traditionally settled. To put it one way, the Kyrgyz are the descendants of Genghis Khan, while the Pamiris, like all Tajiks, are the offspring of Alexander the Great. That is, in a sense, literally true. We walked down to the bazaar, a scruffy mess of caravans, shipping containers, and yurts. Through a doorway I saw a pile of yak pelts. Then it was back on the highway to go to Karakul Lake and over the highest pass of our journey. The sky was open and blue. skirts the demilitarized zone along the Chinese border. I'm going to try and run to this rock about 15 meters up this little hill. Let's see how I go. After the pass, the road was good, and mostly flat, until we came to the blazing blue water of Karakul. However difficult life is in Murgab, it's even tougher here. Karakul town is just a few houses, a mosque and a military base.
This would be as far as we would go down the Pamir Highway. The border with Kyrgyzstan was closed to most foreigners after ethnic clashes between Kyrgyz and Tajiks in one of the enclaves down in the Fergana Valley earlier that year. To understand the Pamir region today, you need to understand its recent history. In 1991, the Soviet Union dissolved and Tajikistan became an independent country. At the same time, there was a rise in Pamiri nationalism and a nationalist party took over in the region. Then, as Tajikistan descended into civil war, the gorno badakhshan region declared itself an independent country. Because of that, during the conflict, the Pamiris were mainly on the side of the opposition forces fighting the government and they then lost. So, gorno badakhshan has always had a difficult relationship with the government of Tajikistan. However, for much of the post-Civil War period, the central government hasn't been strong enough to enforce strict control, and so the Pamiris have been relatively independent, the last region of Tajikistan resistant to President Rahman's control. Now, remember where this region is. Afghanistan grows a lot of opium, and it has to go somewhere, so some of it passes along the Pamir Highway. That, along with the comparative lack of control by the central government, has meant that informal leaders have become major players controlling the region. It is broadly accepted that these informal leaders are involved in illegal activities, like drug or ruby smuggling. However, at the same time, they also do have real local authority and respect. In the words of one journalist, in the mountains of Badakhshan, local leaders and respected individuals are often part of an anti-systemic grey zone. This is relevant because as the central government has gotten more in control of Tajikistan, it has tried to crack down and has conducted military operations in the region. So is the central government cracking down because of the illegal activity, which there is plenty of in other parts of Tajikistan, or because it wants to squash competition to itself? In 2012, the head of the intelligence agency for Gorno Badakhshan was dragged out of his car and fatally stabbed. The Tajik government accused a former warlord who had been integrated into the national army after the civil war. In the resulting clashes between the Tajik military and the militants associated with these informal leaders, there were wildly conflicting reports. State-owned television said nobody had been killed. The BBC said at least 12 soldiers and 30 militants were dead, as did Al Jazeera and the Associated Press, and Radio Free Europe reported that snipers had killed at least six civilians, including children. We will probably never know. In November 2021, there were mass protests after the Tajik security services killed the local man. The protesters laid his body in the center of town and tried to seize a government building. Then the security services fired into the crowd, killing at least one other person. What has followed has been a wave of repression, including the government cutting off internet to the entire region. I'm recording this in March 2022, and Gorno-Badakshan still has no internet almost six months later. So it appears that the truce between the Gorno-Badakshan region and the Tajik central government might be starting to unravel. That's just one of the storylines that run through the Pamir region. <laughs> It was a beautiful morning in Karakul, but it was time to get back on the highway, back the way we had come, back over the pass, and back past the herds of sheep. We had lunch in Murgab, and then stopped in a field to admire a man's yaks. He invited us in for tea. He told us he has about 20 yaks. Getting around 100 kilograms of meat from each and selling it at three to four dollars a kilogram, his yaks might be worth around six thousand dollars at the market. He told us he is moderately wealthy for the area. The 
That night, we stayed in Bulunkul. First, we went down to the lake, which had more mosquitoes than I had ever seen. Bulunkul itself is a tiny village with a dirt volleyball court and kids riding bikes. In the late afternoon, we witnessed the most magical scene. Men brought in their sheep and cattle for the night. Two girls came out to play with their dogs. The wonderful thing was that they almost completely ignored us. I guess they were used to tourists. Two older girls, maybe their sisters, came to collect in the washing, laid out on the grass. Then it was time to play in the water, while their even littler sisters watched on the bank. the dogs played the same game, ignoring the drying clothes. As the afternoon turned to evening, a football game was just starting. I asked if I could join in. I tried not to run too much. We were still at 3,700 meters. Oh, good. Not bad, right? Considering the altitude. That evening we ate fish from the lake and retired to bed. And Marinka. Something else. No, it's not Marinka. I think this Marinka is just like Marinka. In the morning we were shown Bullenkul's little school with a fireplace in each classroom and posters of the president vibing out with the wheat. Much of their nice stuff has apparently been donated by foreign tourists from the days before COVID, when they used to come through here. The next two days were going to be long ones in the car, even though we were taking a shortcut back to Korog. Once again, we passed a fleet of Chinese city buses being delivered to Dushanbe. We stayed a night in Korog, and then we're once again following the river which marks the border with Afghanistan. Below us, the river raged, providing an impassable barrier along the frontier. It was surprising to see some of the visible wealth in the villages on the other side. We passed the same Taliban checkpoint on the other side that had seemed so strange a week before. That night, our last of the trip was a special one. In a hall across the road was a wedding. Improbably, they didn't at all mind three foreigners gate crashing, and our final night on the Pamir Highway, just like the first, was one of dancing. <laughs>
20 years ago, the government of Tajikistan ceded about a thousand square kilometers of territory to China. Then, in 2004, they opened this 93 kilometer stretch of road connecting the Pamir Highway to the Chinese road network. Some people are really excited about the opportunities that this might bring. Other people are worried about Chinese influence. So far, the impact has been minimal. Mostly trucks just pass through here on the way to Dushanbe. There are rumors that the bulk of the benefits of the China trade have gone to the president and his family. However, that might not always be the case. Up here in the Pamirs, a lot of people think that it is China that is going to determine the future of the region. And for Tajikistan as a whole, it is their position between China and Russia, which is the overarching geopolitical question, just as it is for every country in Central Asia. And right up here on the roof of the world, you might be able to see the answer to that question on this road right behind me.